Hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dan Reeser. I'm, uh, I'm here from the Wormhole Foundation. I'm one of the, the two co-founders of the Wormhole Foundation working on the Wormhole Protocol. Um, what we're building is a blockchain interoperability solution. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Wormhole itself, but I'm really here to educate you a little bit more on what interoper interoperability is and some of the use cases that we're seeing today and what we expect for the future. Um, I don't think I can hear anyone from the crowd. I was going to ask people what they think they're seeing, so I'm just going to pause and let you think about what this might be. That was an image of a cable running under the ocean that connects the global internet as we know it today. Um, pretty crazy. The orange in this image is actually cables that are laid across the ocean by just four companies, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Google and Microsoft. And the rest, of course, the blue are, are other companies. But my point here is that there are 1.2 million kilometers of cable connecting the internet that we don't really see, we don't really think about. But without this, we would not have an internet as we know it today and the entire economy that's been built on top of the internet. So we, we had to be connected first, and we had to lay a foundation of infrastructure. Um, I won't go through all of this, but this is just to, to show you that dating back to the, even the 1850s, people were building infrastructure to connect people for communication. So going back to the telegraph and then into the 1950s, 60s, 80s, um, building infrastructure for connecting the actual internet with fiber optic, fiber optic cables and things like this. But why am I giving you this analogy? Um, where we are today in the blockchain industry is very similar to where we were in the 1950s and 1960s because we have a lot of isolated networks that need to be connected in order to build more powerful applications. And we're building that right now as we speak. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the history of the blockchain industry. I, I, I expect if you're sitting here, you probably know about Bitcoin and how, how crypto kind of evolved into what it is today. Um, but this graph right here is showing you just the number of active blockchains um, from 2013 to 2023. So obviously, really rapid growth, and this is going to continue to increase um, over time. This graph is showing the ratio of decentralized exchange, so Uniswap as an example, versus centralized exchange volume like Coinbase or uh, Mercado Bitcoin or Binance. More and more activity is coming on-chain from centralized applications like Binance into applications like Jupyter on Solana or like Uniswap in the Ethereum ecosystem. So with all this activity coming on-chain, we need more connectivity between various blockchains. And this could be private blockchains. This could also be public blockchains. Um, but interoperability, just to define it for you, is enabling isolated blockchain networks to communicate data between one another. Um, this data can be value. So this can be tokens that are being transferred between blockchains. But this data can also be any form of arbitrary data. So this can be um, governance decisions on, on Uniswap, which I'll get into later. This could be real world data, like weather data or sports data for various applications. But enabling transfer of data is very important for the future of the industry. Um, this enables a lot of things. If you're building an application or if you're building a blockchain, you, you obviously want to reach the maximum number of users that you can. Um, so why would you only launch an application on one blockchain? You need to launch your application on many blockchains at once um, and leverage the various communities on those different chains. So user growth, scalability. TVL is an is a acronym for total value locked that's often used in the industry. Um, a lot of applications, especially in DeFi, are looking to grow their, their TVL. Um, so this is also a way to scale their, their numbers and their statistics. So interoperability is uh, quite technical and complex in terms of how all these parts work together. So I made this interoperability stack diagram to break down the various levels of um, how interoperability works. Um, at the bottom here, you see the messaging layer. This is the most fundamental layer for enabling this data transfer between chains. Wormhole is an example. Axelar is another example of teams that are building these uh, messaging layers connecting chains. One layer up 
Um, this is still probably the most, um, the biggest use case for these messaging layers, which is the transfer of tokens. Mayan, Portal, and even Circle's uh, CCTP, which enables transfer of USDC. These are all examples of token bridges that are enabled by messaging systems at the, at the fundamental level. Up to the third level here, um, it gets interesting. This is an aggregation layer. So LiFi and Socket are two of the bigger teams um, building these types of, of bridges. The best example I can give is uh, if you could imagine pulling up an application and having one application to call a ride, but they're aggregating taxis, Ubers, and Lyfts all in one place. You're just getting the best ride, the cheapest ride, or the fastest ride um, that the application finds for you. This is exactly what LiFi and Socket are doing. They're aggregating a bunch of different messaging layers, or messaging protocols, and token bridges to give you the best possible route, whether that uses Wormhole, or Mayan, or Portal. They're just giving the user the best experience. And then finally, the application layer. This is, these are wallets. So Backpack and Phantom are, are pretty big Solana-based wallets. And then MetaMask, of course, is the default wallet in the Ethereum ecosystem. Many of these wallets are already beginning to integrate interoperability for transfers across chains to make it very easy for users to go from Solana to Ethereum or from SWE to Ethereum very easily inside uh, their wallet without having to worry about blockchains um, and all the complexity associated with that. Um, I, I won't cover everything on this slide, just a few, a few things to quickly highlight in terms of important decision, uh, decision making criteria. If you're, if you're at, a, at a company building a blockchain or building an application, um, security is, of course, probably the, the most important decision making criteria here. Um, the decentralization or open, open source. Uh, having open source code is, is very important because you need to be able to get in and verify what you're using and how it works. Um, you'd be surprised, we're in, we're in Web3, we're in crypto, but you'd be surprised how many teams are not building fully open source uh, projects, which in my opinion might as well be a Web2 project. So um, this is just to highlight a few of the other use cases that, are, that we're seeing across the industry when it comes to interoperability. Um, DeFi, of course, is one of the, the biggest use cases and will continue to be. Governance is, is very interesting, and I have a slide on Uniswap later, so I won't go into that quite yet. Um, NFTs are, are very interesting because they're, NFTs are very, very focused on building community, and they've realized that just focusing on walk, one blockchain is somewhat limiting in terms of how much they can grow their community. So um, DGods is one example of a team who used... Uh, wormhole solution to go from Solana to Polygon to Ethereum, and they're tapping into various user groups and growing, uh, growing their community through that. And then at the bottom here, this, this is actually a category of applications that is uh, beginning to grow, I think, much more quickly, and we'll see more of this. Um, in the past you know, 10, 15 years in the, in the industry, people built applications, launched them, and then tried to figure out how to take these applications to multiple blockchains. But today, applications like Pike and Synonym are building with multi-chain in mind from day one. So it's a lot easier for them to build great user experiences um, from day one by thinking of this uh, from the get-go. So now I'm going to transition a little bit into use cases. Um, and I, I assume there are some people in the, in the room here from... Uh, various fintechs or banks or, or other institutions that are thinking about building either applications or building an entire blockchain for your organization. Um, so, so I'm going to get into some uh, statistics and, and use cases around this. This was a pretty shocking number uh, that I found yesterday around the cost of inefficiencies of cross-border payments to institutions like banks and fintechs. Globally, it's around $1.1 trillion uh, every year. Um, this is also a statistic just to show you the, the volume um, that we see on a global basis. But here in Brazil, uh, 76 billion reais per day is transferred through PIX. Um, so the, the amount of money and volume going through these traditional payment systems is, is very large, but also shows the potential for bringing this onto blockchains and speeding them up and saving money for institutions uh, will continue to be 
a trend that we'll see in the industry. So why, why are it, uh, banks and why are fintechs building layer two blockchains or private blockchains? Um, there's several reasons. Reducing costs of intermediaries is an obvious one. Um, you can think of it as peer to peer, but in this case it would be bank to bank. Um, instead, of, instead of doing settlements at the end of the day or at the end of the week, this is instant, instantaneous payments between banks whenever their users are transferring funds um, to one another. Um, Increasing transparency is an obvious one. This is one of the, the fundamental traits of blockchains to begin with. Of course, you can have uh, private blockchains if you need to keep some of your customer information private. But still, people building private blockchains are talking to us because they want to connect to public blockchains like Ethereum. Um, and then new on-chain revenue streams, I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, this is just an example of what a, a Brazilian interbank settlement system um, could look like using an interoperability solution to connect those, those banks together. Um, some, I'm, I'm sure some of these banks are building their own chains, and I, I bet in five, ten years, all of these banks will have their own blockchains. They'll need to communicate between one another. Um, this allows them to have real-time transfers, as I mentioned, between each other. Um, more accurate views and more accurate accounting on the cash that they have on hand at any time. Um, and then interoperability, so easily transferring money between the banks on-chain, just like they would uh, with the traditional banking system, except now it's instantaneous instead of waiting five days a week for these transfers to go through. But the exciting part is also, assuming these are pri pri private chains at the, in the interbank system that, that you see above, these will also start plugging in to, to public blockchains like Solana, like Ethereum, Polygon, Base, and others. Um, so this is something that Wormhole is per personally working on, and, and all these interoperability solutions are going to be providing, which is connecting private and uh, layer two blockchains to public blockchains to just increase their market share, increase their user base, and allow them to launch new, more powerful applications. Um, other, other use cases here that, that will require interoperability, one, bank-issued stablecoins. Um, there will, of course, start to be central bank digital currencies, but I can also expect um, banks themselves to be launching stablecoins just to make these transfers more seamless and rapid for their users. And then a really exciting one that we, we just recently saw an announcement, I think it was a couple weeks ago, from BlackRock, but bringing real-world assets on-chain. I know in Dubai right now there's a real-world asset summit going on. This will continue to be a, a hot topic in the industry. BlackRock's example is a great one. Um, they are tokenizing a fund called Biddle, which is just a meme for build, build being misspelled. Um, the Biddle fund is a fund that allows anyone who's been uh, you know, approved or KYC'd to purchase a $1 token and hold that token and receive daily dividends that get paid out, I believe, every month. Um, this, will, this token can then be transferred to anyone else within the system that's been KYC'd and approved. Um, but it, but it really exciting to see probably the biggest institution in the world um, bring, bringing a fund on-chain. And in this case, the, the BlackRock fund is launched on the Ethereum blockchain. So in the last five minutes, uh, I'm going to go through some use cases that are live today just to give you uh, a look into what is happening um, a little bit deeper in the on-chain ecosystem when it comes to uh, interoperability. So one is Uniswap. Um, we just announced our sixth deployment with Uniswap the other day. Um, on-chain governance, token-based governance, is very important for these protocols. This is how they evolve. This is how they vote on changes. And in Uniswap's case, they make their decisions on the Ethereum blockchain, but they have Uniswap deployments on... I think, 15 other chains. So how do they make a decision on Ethereum and get that decision communicated to the other deployments on other blockchains so that all Uniswap deployments can be operating in the same way? They're using interoperability solutions to pass a message of data from Ethereum to Optimism, from Ethereum to Avalanche, so that all of the Uniswap deployments are understanding what changes were made via governance on Ethereum. Um, 
I think some people in the room have probably done a, a bridge or a token transfer, but this is just to give you a visual of what this actually looks like. Um, this is Portal Bridge, where someone's sending USDC from the Ethereum blockchain, where they're connecting their MetaMask wallet, to Solana, where they would connect their Solana wallet, which would be Backpack or Phantom, um, and sending these tokens from one chain to another very simply, just, just so you can see what it actually looks like. Um, and, and this slide is to paint the picture for the scale at which we're already seeing um, going across these blockchains using these interoperability protocols. So this is a one-week data set. So just in this one week alone, there's been $150 million sent through the portal bridge from Ethereum to these other blockchains on the right, 53 from SWE, 46 from Solana. You get the point. I'm just showing you that there is a lot of activity going on across all these different blockchains every day at all times. Um, a lot of that activity is also in the, in the category of stablecoins. Um, USDC, USDT, this is a 30-day chart, but in one, in one month, 30 days, um, USDC was seeing a half a billion dollars in volume um, across chains. This is Pith. Uh, Pith is an oracle uh, similar to Chainlink. And Pith is deeply integrated with Wormhole to take their price feeds cross-chain. Uh, we don't need to get into details about what Pith does exactly. But this chart is showing you that Pith's growth, um, by working with a solution to take them multi-chain, had just exponential effects on their user base. Um, you can see when they started going multi-chain and expanding from just Solana, they grew exponentially in daily active users, and they grew exponentially in the number of applications that integrated price feeds from Pith that were being communicated to them via the, the messaging layer that I showed you on the interoperability stack slide. So I've got one minute. Um, I'm going to keep this part quick, but I want to talk a little bit about what's coming in the future in the interoperability space. Um, probably the biggest for us, at least, is zero knowledge bridging, uh, or ZK. Um, you may hear about ZK with regards to blockchains um, and privacy. In our case, we're not talking about privacy. We're talking about removing trust from our system. Uh, we care a lot about the ethos of crypto and why we're here, which is decentralization, open source code, and trustless technology. Um, so using zero-knowledge proofs, we're going to start removing trust in centralized parties. Uh, right now, we have 19 um, world-class validator companies that are helping verify messages going through Wormhole. Um, but in the future, those will continue to exist. But we will also have tr fully trustless routes from various blockchains that don't go through any centralized parties by le leveraging zero-knowledge proofs um, on various blockchains. And we're working closely with AMD on this, who's providing all the hardware to make sure that we're having cheap and fast transfers using ZK. Um, I already talked about RWA, so you understand that this is going to continue being a trend. And then blockchain abstraction, we're, we care a lot about user experience. So I think over time, you'll start to see that more and more of the confusing and technical user experience in crypto will start to be removed via good user experiences in application layer um, applications like wallets and things like this. So I, I know that I threw a lot at you, but I hope you learned um, some new things about what interoper interoperability is, use cases that are coming, and use cases that are, um, that are in, up, in production right now. Um, anyone in the room, if you're interested in learning more, working with us, um, please shoot me an email here. Um, I appreciate your attention, and, and have a good day. Bye, guys.